when we were on vacation, probably one of the highlights for our whole family is that we got to go to a little kangaroo farm. It was kind of a petting zoo, but with kangaroos and other exotic animals in it. And uh, it was just a free-for-all. You're just there walking up to the kangaroos and petting them and even the baby ones we got to hold in our laps. And it was a really neat thing that you just never expect in your life. But we learned a lot about kangaroos that day. And one of the things that was so interesting, and I've probably thought about this every day since I've been there because it's so profound and so amazing. Um, does anybody know how baby kangaroos are born? Well, first of all, they are, they are marsupials, which means that they're mammals which lay eggs, all right? But the, leg, but the eggs are not laid like a bird lays an egg into a nest. The eggs stay inside the uterus of the kangaroo, and at the proper time, this one and a half inch long little fetus that's in there cracks its way through the egg, and then, even though it's not ready to be totally born yet, it leaves the uterus, this one and a half inch long little hairless little pink thing, and it crawls up the outside of the mother kangaroo through the fur up to the pouch. It finds its way up there, it crawls into the pouch, and I always thought a pouch was just a pouch, just like a, a pocket. But inside, that is where the little fetus continues to grow it can suck on its mother's milk inside of there, and it continues to grow until the time that it's ready to survive on its own. And that was just amazing hearing about that, that this little thing crawls up the fur and gets in there. It knows where to go. Um, another thing that was interesting is, is that if during the time that this, that this baby kangaroo um, is still not ready to be out on its own outside of the, the, the pocket, um, let's say that the mother is already impregnated another time. The new egg that's inside of there will pause its growing until it's time that this, that this pouch is free so that the new one can continue its process. So even this little bitty embryo that's inside this kangaroo can go on pause, kind of like a hibernation until the time is ready for it to continue its process. And just learning about these things, it was just so amazing. And while these, this birth is not something supernatural, it's definitely unique, it's very interesting, it's just too wonderful to try to just conceive just the, the uniqueness and the beauty in that kangaroo birth. And Abraham and Sarah, who we've been looking at the last few weeks, they had a supernatural birth. Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was 90 years old when they gave birth to their child, their son named Isaac. This was truly supernatural. It was something that was impossible from a human natural level, but God on a supernatural level allowed this to happen. Now, they knew for 25 years that they had the promise that a child would be born. And for 25 years, they had to wait for this to happen. And even when they grew so old, they thought, this is not going to happen now. If it wasn't going to happen then, it can't happen now. God came through and showed them that his purposes and his plans stood firm. During that 25-year wait, though, it wasn't always easy. And at one point along the way, about 10 years into it, they kind of decided... We need to come up with our own plan for how this child is going to be born. Obviously, God has not done his little miracle yet. Ten years have passed. Come on, God. If you said something's going to happen, isn't it about time? And they went their own way. And we're going to take a look at that and compare the supernatural birth with the natural birth. God's supernatural plans with man's natural plans. And see what we can learn from that. We'll begin by looking at the supernatural birth. The birth of Isaac, and we read about that in Genesis chapter 21. You can read it on your screen or in your bulletin. It's here. It says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time that God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. 
And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. We can go ahead and laugh with joy with her. Imagine being childless her whole life, being barren, having even had the promise that a child would be born and it didn't happen for so long. And finally it did. You can imagine just how joyful she was. To hold that baby, that promised baby in her arms. And as a result of this baby that was born, God was doing something much bigger than just giving them a baby to enjoy. God was saying, I'm setting a plan in place for which I am going to show the whole world how much I love the world. And I'm going to start with a family. I'm going to start with a nation of people. And I am going to love them, and they are going to love me, and I'm going to teach them how to live, and they're going to follow me. And as they do that, they will have a relationship with me. And the people that are not part of this family are not part of this race of people. They will see this, and they will learn, and they'll say, we want to be a part of that too. We want to have a relationship with God just like these people have. And that was God's plan for setting up the Hebrew nation, the Jewish nation, through the line, the lineage of Abraham. And through this son... He had a son who had a son, and it just kept going on and on and on. And eventually, another promised son came, and that was Jesus. To be able to say, I'm going to show you even more what it means to have a relationship with God. And he came to earth, and he taught us, and he lived a life that's an example, and he gave up his life, as we sang about in so many of these songs today, so that we could have life with him. And so God was doing this great big plan God had something supernatural planned. He had something unexplainable, mysterious, larger than life. And when God works, it's larger than life. How many things that we've seen God do that we just can't explain? We just can't explain it. Because it's supernatural. We live in a natural world. We have laws and rules and ways of doing things that... That makes sense. It's the way things are set up. There's an order to things. But when things go above that order, then it's God is in it. When he works in our hearts, when he works in our circumstances, when he does these miraculous things, those are supernatural things. And the only way we can explain it is one word. God. Even people who don't even believe in God, sometimes they're just dumbfounded. They don't know how to explain it. They just go... Well, there must be a God out there that did this because there's no, no explanation that will allow us to be able to understand this. But yet it's very easy when our brains can't grasp things to come up with our own explanations. We're told that instead of saying God created it, it just happened by chance. We're told that instead of giving God credit, that it's just a thing called karma. It's just a a way of the universe that's out there. But there's something more to it. Sometimes we say, instead of giving God credit, we said, well, I did it myself. I accomplished this. I was smart. I made the right decisions. And things turned out this way. And we take credit for ourselves, for supernatural things that only God can do. Sometimes we're taking away from God the chance for him to do something supernaturally because we just step in and do it our way. We do it the natural way. And that is what Abraham and Sarah did 10 years into this. They said, we're supposed to have a child that hasn't happened yet, so let's find a way to do it. And in Genesis 16, we read about this. And it says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. So go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. The pagan peoples at that time, if they were wealthy enough to have slaves and servants, and if the wife wasn't able to produce children, then it was a common thing for the wife's servant to be able to take that place and bear a child in her place. And that child would be basically adopted into the master's family and be raised as, as the master and the, mister, and the, and the, and the mother's um, child. 
Now, of course, when you do things like that, you're, you're messing with nature and a lot of problems can happen. There was a lot of tension in, the, in Abraham's family because of this son that was born. Um, and, you know, you wonder then, what were they thinking afterwards? They're like, well, maybe we've made a big mistake. But yet God, you know, he tortured us by giving us a promise, holding it out there like the little carrot on the stick. And saying, you've got to wait for it, you've got to wait for it. And finally, you kind of lose patience. And you do things your own way. And that's what they did. They did things their own way. It wasn't God's promised child. It wasn't the supernaturally born child. But yet they chose to go the natural way at that time. But even though they made a mistake, even though they did it on their own, God didn't give up on them. He didn't say, okay, you, you screwed it up, so I'm going to find somebody else to do this. God said, I'm going to give you a second chance. Wait on me. Wait on me and let me do the supernatural. And Abraham and Sarah waited another 15 years after that mistake for God to be able to do what he promised to do through them. And in our lives, we might blow it. We might blow it once. We might blow it twice. We might blow it 20, 50, 100 times. But God says, come back. I'm going to give you second chances and third chances and fourth chances. That's the kind of God that we have. That he wants us to be able to trust him and learn through our mistakes. Not to just keep making the dumb mistake over and over and over again. There's a difference between making the same mistake a million times and not learning from it. And taking something from it and go, okay, I think I need to, to trust God this time around. And it might be hard to do it. We still might slip up, but maybe we make a little three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. But if we keep moving in the right direction and learn from our mistakes, that's what God wants to do. And over and over again, we see that God has done that. And through those mistakes, we, our faith can actually deepen. We know that, that our muscles of faith are developed through things like doubt, hardship, temptation, service, frustration, love, patience, things that, that aren't always easy to do. Those things strengthen those faith muscles. It doesn't just come to us as a nice zap from heaven where we're just a happy, faithful people and we just go on our lives that way. Our spiritual muscles are developed just like our physical muscles are. We have to work them. We have to be disciplined. We make our faith grow by our response to God's faithfulness to us and allowing us to be able to grow. If you think about it, Abraham and Sarah had to spend a lot of years developing those faith muscles. 25 years of developing them. And even more than that, because if you remember the story after Isaac was born, several years later, while he was still a child, God gave Abraham the faith test of his lifetime. If he thought waiting 25 years for a natural, for a supernatural child to be born was, was tough, God gave him an even tougher assignment. Sometimes our, our tough assignments now prepare us for even tougher assignments later on in life. And maybe there's things you're going through now or that you've gone through and you say, I don't know if I could have made it if I hadn't had trial A, B, and C. To be able to get to trial X, Y, and Z. Sometimes those hard things we go through, not that they're there necessarily on purpose, but through them, our faith can deepen so that we can handle some of the tougher tests that come along our way. But... God gave Abraham an even tougher test. He said, I promised you this child and I gave it to you supernaturally, but now I want you to go out and offer this child as a sacrifice to me. Lay it on the altar and take that child's life. I mean, none of us would want to take any of our children's life, even if God asked us to. I've thought about that so many times. If God said, do something like that, well, first of all, I'd say that goes against God's nature. He would never ask something like that. Why would God do something so atrocious? But what if he did? Would we trust his word, even if it sounds like it's totally far out and unbelievable? God's probably not going to ask us to do something like that. The trials or the things he asks us to do 
are much more in line with, with the normal things that he asked us to do. This was an exception because through this exception, God showed us what it was to be able to sacrifice someone that you love, which God did himself. Whereas God the Father and God the Son went through the ultimate sacrifice for us. And so what God was asking Abraham to do was nothing that he would he himself be willing to do. As God the Father and God the Son, several thousand years later, went through the same thing. And Abraham was willing to take that child and trust God's word because he had learned before to trust God's word. Even though it was hard, even though he had made mistakes. And he said, this time I'm going to follow through. And I'm going to trust the supernatural. And later on we read that Abraham was willing to do it because he thought, well, if God promised this child, and now God's asking me to kill this child, then probably God's going to raise this child back to life again. That's what he thought. That had never happened before. He didn't have, God didn't tell him that was going to happen, but he had faith to believe that God was going to do something supernatural. He didn't know what it was. But that seemed like a good explanation to him. And so he was willing to go through with that. And of course, God intervened. And at the time he was ready to strike his child, God said, wait, I've got a better sacrifice here. And gave him a lamb that was caught in the, in the bushes nearby and said, offer this up. Keep your son. Because God knew that Abraham had learned through his faith. We knew those faith muscles were strong. And Abraham is set up to us throughout the scripture as an example of a faithful man, of a faithful person that we can be like as well. As we look at his faith, then we're able to, to strive towards that kind of faith as well. In Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, we're told to throw off everything that hinders us and to throw off the sin that easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that gives us faith in the first place, that pioneer, but he's the perfecter. He makes it perfect over time. He helps it to grow. He helps it to be strengthened, to be deepened, so that we have faith that can stand up against anything, any of the battles that we face, any of the trials that come our way, the temptations that come our way. He is there to be able to help us to do that. How do we deepen our faith? I'm going back to this chart that I'm using already several times I've talked about here, and I just think this is something I'll be coming back to over and over again as we grow. This chart tells us how we grow as Christians. It starts off with knowledge. As our knowledge of God grows, both through what we hear and read and what we experience, then it deepens our faith. And as our faith deepens, then it changes our character, who we are on the inside. And as who we are on the inside becomes more in reflection of who God is, then our actions start to mirror that. And we start doing things, acting ways that we wouldn't have in the natural way, but in a supernatural way. And as we begin to do the things that God asks us to do, we act on those and increases our knowledge because we have a new experience. And as that knowledge grows, our faith deepens. As our faith deepens, our character is transformed. As our character is transformed, our actions reflect God. As our actions reflect God, we get more knowledge of God. And this thing just keeps going on and on and on, all of it simultaneously. It's not like you go from one to the next to the next. It's all happening in different areas of our life all at once. And I just think this is so beautiful because this is the way God works in our lives. It helps us to be able to reflect him. And this is something supernatural. This is something that happened in Abraham's life. As he spent 25 years getting to know God, it strengthened his faith. As his faith got, got strengthened and deepened, it changed his character. At first, his faith was weak, and he made bad decisions, but he began to make good decisions later on. His character was transformed, and as his character was transformed, he was able to do the work of God even to the point of being able to be willing to sacrifice the life of his, his only son. And so we see that happening in the life of Abraham. And as he went through that, his knowledge of God got deeper. And it goes, went on and on in his life. And that's what could happen in our life as well. So why settle for the natural 
when God gives us the supernatural, when he works in our spirits, when we get our eyes off of the circumstances around us and see things through his eyes, yeah, that problem I have right now, how does God see that problem? Ask God to show you, how does he see that problem? And he will enlighten us and allow us to be able to see things from his point of view, not just our, our natural point of view, what we see with our own eyes. Those challenges, those disappointments, those frustrations, all those things that we go through, we ask God, can I see this from your point of view? And to realize not everything's solved in three easy steps. Life is a process. Some of the things we go through might take us 25 years to get through it. We don't know, we don't see from a natural way, but God gives us supernatural knowledge that gives us supernatural faith. There's a lot of people out there that are people of faith, but they only have faith when they need something from God. We don't want to be, have that kind of faith. We want faith that allows us to trust him 24-7, 365 days of the year. That's what we're looking for. And we want to have supernatural character. We want people to see us and see Christ in us. I want to be able to end my day when I'm brushing my teeth at night, looking in the mirror saying, did I reflect Christ today in my life? Did I say something? Or maybe I didn't say something I should have. Did I do something that reflects Christ? Did I, did I not do something I should have to reflect Christ? As we can evaluate our days and be able to say, has my character been one that transforms and shows God to people around me? Do the people that I've been around today, would they say that's a person of faith? Or are we just an ordinary person like everybody else? Those are good questions to ask ourselves and to ask God, God, transform me into that person that you want me to be so that my life will have such great purpose and it will influence and do the things that you want it to do. Because if we're people of action, it shows. Most people sit around on their bottoms and they don't do much. But if we're people of action that can do the things of God in the situations that we're in, then it's going to be noticeable and seen around us. The Apostle Paul told us a little bit about this in Romans 8, 5, and 6. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. What is your mind governed by? Is it governed by your flesh, the natural part of you? It just leads to death. It leads to doing the things that will be sinful and selfish. It leads to doing the things that have, has nothing that lives on beyond ourselves. But a, our mind set on the spirit and seeking God and cultivating that with the truth allows us to be able to live out the spirit's will in our life. And I pray that that is our desire for all of us in this congregation today, that we set our minds on the spirit and not on the natural things, that we look for the supernatural and do not settle for the natural.